Good afternoon and welcome. So this session is backdooring hardware devices by injecting malicious payloads on microcontrollers. Um, the room here is South Pacific and our speaker is Shea Leberta. So if those things resonate or make sense to you, you're in the right place. Um, I have a few little notes that I just need to, to go through. First of all, stop by uh, the business hall located in Mandalay Bay Oceanside and Shoreline Ballrooms on level two. The Black Hat Arsenal is in the business hall on level two. And don't forget the merchandise store on level two and session recordings from SOK as they have a desk on every level. Um, just as a reminder, please make sure you put your cell phones on uh, vibrate mode. That's much better for everybody around. But please join me um, before we, uh, without further ado, please join me in uh, introducing or welcoming our speaker, so Shayla Berta. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I'm really, really happy to be sharing this moment with all of you. Um, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Sheila, and I'm an offensive security researcher because I love breaking stuff. I come from Buenos Aires, Argentina, a city 10,000 kilometers far from here at the end of the world. <laughs> And also, and I'm a developer in assembly for microcontrollers and microprocessors, C, C++, Python, and Go. Um, as a speaker, this is my second time giving a talk at Black Hat. And I was also a speaker at DEF CON, Echo Party, Hacking the Box, and other security conferences. But let's go to the important thing. In the last month, that were many, many news about backdoors inside hardware board. We all know that these kind of backdoors exist, and they could be inside smartphones, computers, routers, BMCs, and so on. So, backdoors. Backdoors everywhere. <laughs> um, along the years, have been published many research about different ways of factoring devices through their own hardware components. However, most of those research focuses on devices based on powerful microprocessors like ARM, Intel, or AMD instead of microcontrollers. So let's see some technical differences between them. On one hand, we have microprocessors, which are an entirely CPU. All the necessary, all the components that a microprocessor needs to work, like memories and input and output uses, are physically separated. They are also bigger than a microcontroller and have greater processing capacity. Um, most microprocessors have a modified hardware memory organization and 32 or 64 bits of architecture. While on the other hand, we have microcontrollers. They have inside a little CPU and all the necessary components to get it working. I mean, inside a microcontroller, we have the CPU, RAM, ROM, input and output uses, and other peripherals. The fact that microcontrollers are putting it all together in a very tiny space makes them with a less processing capacity and slower than microprocessors. Um, there are other technical differences too. Microcontrollers have hardware memory organization and 16 bits of architecture. They also have a little stack. For example, the PK team family have a stack able to store up to 31 memory addresses. If this gets overflowed, the PIC will reset itself. Just some information. <laughs> so, after understanding the main differences between microprocessors and microcontrollers, a question that could arise is why some would use some microcontroller instead of a powerful microprocessor? Well, usually microprocessors are implemented on multitasking devices that need to run an entirely operative system. On the other hand, micro microcontrollers are used for doing a specific tasks, usually the same, the same work dealing with the same kind of input and output, like automatizing a routine. It's like comparing a Raspberry Pi, which has an ARM microprocessor, to an Arduino, which has an 
Atmel microcontroller. Both are useful devices, but they are used for different purposes. So microcontrollers have evolved a lot. Too many years ago, PIC-12, a very simple pinout with basic input and output ports, and a few peripherals. PIC-16, more familiar, some of us learned to program in microcontrollers using these devices. They have more peripherals, including user communication and CCP modules. PIC-18, also called high-performance microcontrollers, are my favorite ones. They are quite complex, with a lot of peripherals, supporting different communication protocols like USB, CAN, and so on, as well as all the common peripherals, such as timers, uh, analog to digital converters, CCP modules, and so on. And finally, we have the 32-bit microcontrollers. Uh, they, they are the most similar thing to a powerful microprocessor, even they use Cortex-M CPU, but they're still being a microcontroller. So after all, targeting microcontrollers worth it for? Well, nowadays they are responsible for controlling a wide range of systems, like physical security systems, sound cars, AQ, semaphores, elevators, sensors, components of industrial systems, some home appliances, and even robots. This is a car's EQ um, for controlling the fuel injection, and it's fully controlled by a PIC-18 microcontroller. So there are interesting devices to target into. All microcontrollers need to be programmed, otherwise they'll, they will do nothing. As I said, there is a little CPU inside them which is able to execute every assembly instruction of a program loaded in the microcontroller's program memory. These are the steps for programming microcontrollers. We can develop the firmware in assembly or C. After compiling and assembling it, we're gonna get the hex file. The hex file is the firmware. To load the firmware into the microcontroller, we need to use the programmer software and hardware usually provided by the microcontroller's manufacturer. Similar to the world of microprocessors, every microcontroller vendor has their own assembly instruction set for the CPU of their devices. This is an example to turning on a LED in a PIC microcontroller. I love programming them in assembly, but it's possible to use both assembly or C. For microchip device, devices, we can use the NPLAB ID, which is free, to develop and compile our firmware. By building the project, we're gonna get the hex file, the firmware ready to be written in the microcontroller's program memory. As I said, it's necessary the programmer, software, and hardware to load the firmware into the microcontroller. So these are the microchip official tools we can use the NPLAB ID or IPE to communicate with the PQ3, which is the programmer hardware, and load the firmware into the microcontroller. The interesting thing here is that, as well as we can use these tools for write the program memory, we can use them for read the program memory. I mean, we can write a firmware into a microcontroller or we can dump the firmware. So let's see how we can dump the program memory. First of all, this is the memory organization of a microchip microcontroller. We have the program memory, which is where the firmware is, and it's the memory that we will dump. But there are other two memories. The RAM, which contains the SFR, special function registers, and the CPR, general purpose registers, <coughs> and the ROM memory, where the program can store data that won't be lost after a reset. So the ROM memory and the program memory are non-volatile, while the RAM is the RAM, is volatile. So to make a memory dump, the first step is connecting the target device, the microcontroller, to the PQ3. There are other tools for doing this process, but 
I prefer to use the official tool because it works very well and it's cheap. It costs around $40. So here we have an example of connection. And we need to match the pins between the microcontroller and the PIC3 connector. For example, we have to connect the, the PPP pin of the microcontroller must be connected to the BPP pin of the PQ3 connector, and so on with the other pins. It's very easy. So after that, we connect the PQ3 to our computer through the USB port, and we can open the MPLAB ID to dump the firmware. The first step is create, we need to create the, a standalone project in the MPLAB ID and specify what microcontroller has used in our target device. Fortunately, it's very easy to get this information because the PIC model is printed on the microcontroller. And then we must set the programmer hardware. In this case, it's the PIC kit free. Finally, we can use this option in the MPLAB ID to dump the firmware into a hex file. The MPLAB ID has a disassembler. So we can load the hex file and then go to target memory view, program memory, and there we're gonna see the disassembly view. There we can find all the assembly instructions of the program with their respective opcode to be executed by the CPU, and also the memory address of one of them where they are located is present too. Let's compare. In one side, the source code, and in the other side, the disassembly view of that. This program, after the start, has five assembly instructions, and we can find them in the disassembly view. It's almost equal. The only difference is the access word after some instructions, because <coughs> port D and 3D are special function registers they are located at the RAM memory. So the access words means that a data memory access is performed. By observing the opcodes, we can map the assembly instructions in the hex dump. They're gonna be inverted because of the little endian format. Like most microprocessors, microcontrollers use little endian to store bytes in memory. Okay, now that we learned how to dump the firmware, let's see how we can modify the hex file and reload the firmware with something injected in order to alter the original behavior of the target device. When injecting a payload into a binary or process, we need to find a place where our payload gets executed at least once. In this case, we need the same. So, the next step is to find a place inside the firmware where we could inject a malicious code or payload. I will explain three different injection techniques. The first one is about injecting at the entry point, I mean when the program starts. But where is the entry point? So this is a standard structure of a program for microchip devices. The first four sections are, are sort of self-explained and they are not important for us at this moment. So let's focus on the reset vector. The reset vector is always present at the address 0000, zero, zero, zero. and it's followed by, by a jump, <coughs> sorry, it's followed by a goto to the first assembly instruction of the program. Basically, the entry point. In the middle, the interroot vector is present at the address 8 or 18, but we will go deeper on that later. Here we have an example. We can observe the, the jump to the entry point in the source code as well as in the disassembly view. This little program does not use interruptions, so the, 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 the goto in the reset vector is making a very short jump. But in large programs, like this other one, the jump is going to be quite longer. So remember, the reset vector will be always present at the memory address 0000. It's the first line in the disassembly view. 
there we're gonna find a go route to the entry point. So in the first example, the entry point is at the address 06. And in the second case, it's at 7F84. Those are the memory addresses where we should inject our payload to get it executed when the program starts. <clears throat> but, and the next question is, what should we inject? How can we build a payload for this kind of devices? Well, we have to use the specific assembly instruction set for our target device. This is an example to turn it on two different LEDs in a PIC microcontroller. We need to get the opcodes of these instructions. An option to get them is by writing all the assembly instructions of our payload in an assembly file inside a standalone project in the MPLAB ID and then compile it so we can see the opcodes in the disassembly view. Those gonna be the opcodes of our payload. But remember the little Indian format. So this one gonna be our final payload. So we are ready to make the injection. In this case, the entry point is located at the address 28. We have to locate this address in the hexam. For that, we can look for the base memory address, 20 in this case, and then count until eight bytes. There is where the entry point is located and where we should inject the opcodes of our payload. But there is something that we should keep in mind, the checksum. It's at the end of every line, and if we modify something, we must recalculate it for every affected line. But first, we're gonna inject our payload at the entry point. The original bytes located at that part will be shifted to the right. Remember that the, the byte of the checksum must not be moved. We're gonna recalculate it. This is the math that we should do. Um, for example, if we have this line, we should sum all the bytes of the line and then make a not plus one. And the last byte of the outcome is gonna be our checksum. But there is always a lifesaver, <laughs> and we can use this website to calculate the checksum fastly. So remember, for every affected line after payload injection, we have to fix the checksum. If we don't, we're gonna get an error at the moment of loading this modified firmware into the microcontroller. So finally, we can use the MPLAB ID or MPLAB IP together with the PK3 to load this modified firmware into the target device. What's the result? Well, for example, um, this is the target device with the original firmware, and this is what happened after loading the new firmware, the modified firmware, with our payload injected. The first light is on because it's part of the original program, but, but there are other two lights on due to our payload. So the proof of concept works. It is like pop a calc, but hardware version. Let's see a real case. This is a dashboard for observing the behavior of a car's EQ that handled the fuel injection. Here we have four blue lights for the four petrol injectors and other four yellow lights for the four CNG or CNB injectors. In normal behavior, the EQ will start injecting petrol and then switches on CNG. In the firmware of this EQ, the entry point is located at the address 15.2a. I placed a little payload there to modify the right behavior and continue injecting petrol after switching. So the EQ will, will be injecting both petrol and CNG at the same time. That might not be cool for the car. So let's see a video. That's the car EQ, and we'll start seeing the normal behavior. The blue lights are on because the car starts using petrol. 
I will speed up the card to automate to rechain out the the condition to automatically switch to C and C. That's when the petrol injector stops working and the card is using C and C. Now I'm loading the modified firmware into the EQ in the microcontroller of the EQ, and I will repeat the process. The car starts using petrol, and after switching, the petrol injectors don't stop working, and the EQ is injecting both petrol and CNC at the same time. This is just an example, something bad for the car. Okay, let's talk about the second injection technique. Maybe we prefer to get our payload executed not when the program starts, but when a specific action occurs. It might be associated to an interruption. In big programs, there will always be interruption because most of the tasks that the microcontroller can perform triggers interruptions to alert that something happened. For example, the internal timers, analogous to digital converters, CCP modules, transmission and reception peripherals, as well as other peripherals of the microcontroller. This is the execution flow when an interruption occurs. No matter what the microcontroller is doing, when an interruption is triggered, it will jump to the interrupt vector at the address 8 for high priority interruptions or 18 for low priority interruptions. Once there, a procedure known as polling is used for detecting who triggers the interruption. It was the timer, was the CCP module, or who. After detecting who was, the corresponding call routine is executed. The red find instruction at the end will throw back the program counter to the main code at the memory address immediately after the instruction executed before the interruption occurs. Some of the special function registers aim interruption handling. If a program is using interruptions, the bits GIE and PIE of the intcon registers will be set to one. In assembly, it looks like this. The PSF instruction is used to set to one a bit of a given register. So when we dump a firmware, we can look for these two instructions in the disassembly view to know if interruptions are enabled in our target device. For every peripheral that could trigger an interruption, there are two bits inside a special register. The interruption enable bit and the interruption flag bit. As example, we can quote the timer zero. If a program wants to use this peripheral, this timer, the bit TMR0IE must be set to one. When the timer triggers an, an interruption, the TMR0IF will be automatically set to one. While not, this flag will be to zero. Due to the fact that in the latest microcontrollers there are too many peripherals, the special registers Pi1, Pi2, and even Pi3 have interruption enabled bits for different hardware peripherals, and the registers Peer1, Peer2, and Peer3 have their respective interruption flags. So, as I said, a procedure known as polling is used at the interrupt vector to detect who triggers the interruption. For doing this process, it's used the BTF SC instruction for testing the value of the different interruption flags. In this example, we have four peripherals that could have triggered an interruption. The polling process will start testing the flag of one of them. If the flag is set to one, the call below will be done jumping to the call routine that must be executed every time that this specific peripheral triggers an interruption. If not, the polling will continue until find the flag set to one. In the disassembly view, we're gonna see something like this. So, by inspecting the polling, we are able to know what peripherals are being used for our target device. Remember that the polling process will be always located at the address 8 
for high priority interruptions or 18 for low priority interruptions. If we do zoom in one of the interruption flags, we observe that the bit 5 of the peer 1 register is being tested. But what is the bit 5? If we look at the data sheet of our target device, we found that the bit 5 of the peer 1 register corresponds to the RC interruption flag. This is used by communication peripherals. When the microcontroller receives data, this peripheral will trigger an interruption that will set this flag to 1. In the polling process, if this flag is set to 1, the call will be done, and a coroutine located at the address 48, in this case, will be executed. Such coroutine will be do something with the data received by this peripheral. So, by inspecting the polling, we not only know what peripheral are being used for our target device, but we can get memory addresses where we could inject our payload. For example, if we want to do something when the microcontroller receives data from a communication protocol, we have to inject our payload where the RC, RC interruption routine begins. In this case, it's at the address 48. Or if we want to do something when the timer zero triggers an interruption, we should inject at the address 4E, and so on. The idea is be able to modify the original behavior of the microcontroller when it's using its different hardware peripherals. Let's see an example of factoring the user communication using this injection technique. The first step is locating where the RC interruption routine begins. By inspecting the polling, we got that in this case, the memory address is 48. We have to locate this address in the hex dump. So we can look for the base memory address 40 and then count until 8 bytes. There is where the RC interruption routine begins and where we should inject our payload. But what payload? Um, we'll cook a payload that makes a reliance of the received data to a transmission port that we are able to monitor externally. I mean, the microcontroller will receive data from anywhere and it will trigger an interruption. At that moment, our payload will get executed and we will catch such information and relay it to us. In my case, I will use a USB interface because it's easier to show you what happened, but it could be a wireless module too. This is our payload. First, we catch the received data and we move it to the W register. Then the transmission is enabled, the operation mode is set as a synchronous, and the TX pin, the transmission pin, is set as an output. And finally, we move the received data in W to the TX write. Anything written in this register will be transmitted through the TX pin to a USB or wireless module. These instructions could vary a little depending on the target device. These are the opcodes of every assembly instruction and this is our final payload. So, we already know at what memory address we have to inject. In this case, the RC interruption routine begins at the address 48. So, we will place our payload there. Let's see what, what happened. In the next video, you're gonna see a hardware board receiving data from a smartphone. That's when the interruption occurs and the data is relayed to a USB interface. The modified firmware was loaded. The backdoor firmware is loaded in the microcontroller's program memory and we are listening to a USB interface. So we're gonna send a test message to the board and the information is relayed. So, as I said, 
I was using a USB interface, but it could be replaced by a wireless module for remote connection, and it's going to work in the same way. OK, um, after making a payload injection at wherever place, we are making a shifting of bytes that could affect the call and go to instruction. Because now they are jumping to memory addresses whose origi original bytes have been shipped. In large programs, it might be a problem that we have to solve. For example, in the graph, we can observe a call jumping to the address 10, while after payload injection, it should be jumping to the address 16. We have to fix this to avoid a flow corruption. These are the opcodes of the Coro call and knob instructions. In TIC 18, the instructions are 16 bits in length. Eight bits are used for the opcode and eight bits for the address where it has to jump to. But two more bytes are reserved in case of needing jumping more than 255 positions. You have an example. The first jump is to the offset 6, and the second one to the offset 467. But in the disassembly view, we're going to see the memory address. So we have to divide it by 2 to get the offset, and then be able to find it in the hex dump. To fix it, we have to keep in mind the memory address where we have injected our payload and the payload length. We only have to fix those jumps located after the one where we have injected our payload. For example, if we injected at the memory address 48 and we have a call 56, we have to recalculate the jump, making a sum of the original memory address plus the payload length. So probably we'll need to fix some jumps in large program. For example, in this case, I had to fix three different call instructions. But the truth is that injecting the payload, fix the champs, and recalculate the checksum might be a little bit tedious, especially in large programs. So I'm actually working on a little tool to automate in this process. The tool receives as parameter the hex dump, I mean the original firmware, the payload, the offset where it has to be injected, and the name of the output file. So the program basically makes the injection and fix all the necessary things. I hope to be able to publish this tool in, on my GitHub in these days, so stay tuned. OK, let's talk about the last second, sorry, the last injection technique. I will explain how we can alter the microcontroller's stack and take control of the program flow. In microchip devices, there are four special function registers to manipulate the stack. The first one is the stack pointer, while TOSU, TOSH, and TOSL compose the top of the stack. In the graph, we can see an example. The stack pointer is pointing to the second entry of the stack, which the value is 0018034. <laughs> In practical implementation of these registers, first we should increment the stack pointer and then write the TOS registers with the memory address where we want to, to jump. And finally, execute our return. This is how it looks in assembly. First, we increment the stack pointer and then we write all the necessary values to the TOS registers, in this case, to jump to the address 00C72. And finally, it's the return. In the disassembly view, we're going to see something like that. When the return is executed, the program will jump to the memory address 24, in this case. From this example, we can get the opcodes of these instructions. Regarding payload injection, at this moment, we have two alternatives. On one hand, we could inject our payload everywhere in the firmware, 
and then write the those registers with the corresponding memory address. Or well, we can make a ROP chain, writing the those registers with memory addresses for from part of the code that we want to execute. I mean, create the payload with instructions already written in the original program. This is an example of ROP chain. At the left, all the memory addresses of our ROP gaps. That means the memory addresses from the parts of the code that we want to execute. And in the other side, all the necessary opcodes to write the memory addresses in the stack. Those opcodes, including the final read, will compose our payload. Microcontrollers use a leaf of stack too. So the first gadget to be executed will be the one located at the address 28 in this case. It's the last one injected in the ROP chain. This is an example of gadget. It starts at the address 40 and ends at 46 with a red W. All the ROP gadgets must end in a red term or red LW to continue executing the other gadgets in the right way. So let's see a demo. In the next video, you will see a light turning on for every gadget of the ROP chain being executed. It's a nice way that I found to show you what happened. So, eight gadgets of the ROP chain being executed. Of course, they could be less or more. It's just a nice way to see the effects. Okay, finally, let's talk about um, program memory protections. From a security point of view, we cannot avoid that someone overwrites the whole program memory of our microcontroller, but we could protect it from memory dumps and without avoid payload injections. At the beginning of the programs, before the main code, it's necessary to set some configuration bits for microchip devices. And among, the, among those bits, there is the code protection bit. But if we enable only these ones, our program won't be protected against memory dumps. I mean, if you assemble your program with these configuration directives, memory dumps will still work and someone will be able to disassemble your program. To prevent memory dumps, we have to use the boot protection. It is the CPV bit. And also the data protection is useful too. So with this, by enable this specific uh, configuration bit, memory dumps won't work. And if someone tries to dump the firmware of your program, the hex file will contain only zeros, as you can observe in the picture. So conclusions. Um, backdooring microcontrollers is possible, and there are some interesting devices to target into. Um, I explained three different injection techniques. I brought a, a white paper that explains each one of them with details. It's gonna be published in the Black Hat website together with these slides. And though I, I focus on microchip, I think that most concepts can be extended to other vendors. So finally, okay, this broke. Oh. Mm, sorry. This looks like this doesn't work anymore. Yes, the clicker is died. Uh, okay, no problems. Uh, the last is, the slide is only that I want to thank to Sol and Nico Weisman for their help while I was writing the white paper, and to the people of DreamLab for all the support. And thanks to you.